Hello, True Health Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. I have a wonderful interview for you today, especially if you're a woman who has been struggling with her hormones. Um, No matter what stage of your life you're in, you want to make sure that you have a healthy balance of hormones because by doing so, you ensure that you will live a longer and healthier life. There's so many studies pointing to the link between balanced hormones and longevity and mental health. In fact, those without balanced hormones uh, find that they have shorter lives and they might experience dementia later on in their life. And so we want to prevent all that, obviously, and we want to live as healthy as we possibly can. And my guest here today is going to share with you exactly what you can do to help balance your hormones. It's very exciting. I myself suffered from polycystic ovarian syndrome for many years and was able to reverse it, not with the help of a medical doctor. In fact, they only wanted to put me on drugs and birth control. And uh, they said there was no hope. They told me I'd never have kids. And that was the outlook they gave me. And instead, I went the route of natural medicine after years of um, unsuccessfully following the medical doctor's advice. I finally found natural medicine through diet, lifestyle changes, and supplements when necessary. And I help my body come back into balance. And now look, I've got a kid who's about to be three years old and I I no longer have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that's what I want for you as the listener. If you are suffering from endometriosis or any kind of hormone imbalance, estrogen dominance, or maybe just an irregular period, or maybe you have a regular period, but you have a PMS and, and heavy cramps and Uh, You have maybe adult acne, the the kind of symptoms that go along with um, directly related to hormones. Well, my guest today is going to teach you exactly what you can do to balance that. What I want to let you know is that my guest studied at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. This is a program, an online program that I just completed last year, and it's a year-long program. It's actually designed to fit into your life if you're a very busy person. Um, Originally, Joshua Rosenthal, the creator of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, who I've had on the show, it's a great episode. You should go back and listen to it if you're interested in learning about someone who, (laughs) from nothing, created um, one of the world's most well-recognized organizations in health coaching. And uh, so Joshua Rosenthal designed the program so that busy working moms, or at least very busy stay-at-home moms, could still take care of their kids, their husband, their household, themselves, their career, and at the end of the day, also complete the coursework so that within a year, they were a successful health coach. So that is what I'd like to let you know about. If you have any inkling, any desire to work with people and help them to gain their health back, or if you'd like to just have that education, have that under your belt as as a furthering in in your education, in your personal growth, then I highly recommend checking out the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Because so many of my listeners enrolled with them in the last year, I sat down with them a few weeks ago at the beginning of 2018, and I negotiated a even better deal for all my listeners. So when you call them up, and you go to enroll, they will give you $1,500 off. It's a huge amount of money that they will give you off. Plus they have a wonderful payment plan. Oftentimes their payment plan is interest-free, which makes it incredibly easy for you to immediately join and start doing their health coaching program. I would have done this program just for my own personal growth. That's how amazing it was. It, It really did impact my life and I'm very happy I did it. Of course, it made me a better podcaster, made me a better health coach. After graduating, you may choose to work in hospitals, work alongside doctors in clinics, uh, work online through Skype, or you may choose to do things like become a writer, publish books or blogs, uh, or start a health podcast. And the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's online program gives you such a strong foundation, a foundational understanding of health and holistic medicine that you can go do all of that. So as you listen to today's interview, know that some of her information, of course, she went on to study further and, and, and we all should, we should always continue learning, but her foundation of her knowledge came from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And if, if what she is teaching today, my guest here is teaching today, interests you, 
then you should also check out the program. So what you can do is you can give them a call. You can just Google Institute for Integrative Nutrition or Google IIN and give them a call and ask for more information. Or you can go to learntruehealth.com slash coach. And if you go to learntruehealth.com slash coach, you put in your name and email and they'll send you some free coursework. They'll send you some great information so that you can uh, get a feel for whether you'd like to join the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And if you do join, I'd love to support you in your success. Uh, please contact me, support at learntruehealth.com. And I'd love to chat with you, um, mentor you if you'd like, support you in your success in any way that I can. Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you so much for sharing this podcast with those that you love, that you know it would help make a difference in their life. And if you need anything, please reach out to me. You can email me or join our Facebook group. Go to learntruehealth.com slash group or just in Facebook, search for Learn True Health. I look forward to uh, chatting with you in the group and enjoy today's interview. Welcome to the Learn True Health podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 221. I am very excited for today's guest. Nicole Jardim is a wonderful certified health coach. She focuses on women's health and functional nutrition. Nicole's pleasure to have you here today. A lot of my listeners have shared with me that they struggle with uh, having a regular cycle, having uh, a regular menstrual cycle. Um, Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a big, a big, hairy problem that a lot of us um, <laughs> are fighting, and and not only polycystic ovarian syndrome, but there's a, there's a lot of things that that women are coming up against. I feel like it's more of a problem now than it has been in the past. We, I definitely want to get into why you think that may be the case. Um, well, welcome to the show, and what I'm really excited is for the listeners today to learn what they can do to fix their period, which is what you specialize in. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, Ashley. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Now your website, which is NicoleJardim.com. And of course the link to that's going to be in the show notes of today's podcast. You have on the top of your website where women can take the quiz now to find out the root cause of their period problems. Um, that's exciting to, you know, dive into and, and see, well, what's going on here? Is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it a blood sugar problem? Um, do I have, you know, do I have some adrenal fatigue that's causing this? What's, what's going on? Where's the imbalance? What's the root cause of the imbalance? I'd love for you to start by sharing your story. What led you to want to become a certified health coach and help women to balance their hormones naturally? Yes, uh, absolutely. I start. It started a long time ago, as is usually the case with these kinds of conditions and issues. Uh, I was. I had a great childhood, and at when I was eleven, my dad passed away really suddenly, and uh, it just completely turned my world upside down, as you can probably imagine. And uh, when I was about fourteen or fifteen. I started to have major period problems and I had no idea what was going on. Of course, my mom had had horrendous periods when she was a teenager and in her 20s. So she didn't think anything was wrong with me. And up until that point, everything had been relatively normal, as normal as it can be for a teenager. Uh, but around, like I said, 14, 15, I started to have really, really heavy periods. And then suddenly my period was only coming every three to four months. And again, like my friends really all had these kinds of issues. So I thought, okay, well, this is just normal. And like I said, my mom didn't think there was anything wrong necessarily. So I just continued this way for about four years, actually, where I would have these periods every three or four months. And then when they came, uh, they wreaked havoc on my life. They were super heavy, I, like bleed through my school uniform, which is so mortifying as a teenager. And uh, I, I had really painful periods, too. They were so bad that sometimes I wouldn't even go to school for one or two days because I was basically in bed, curled up in the fetal position, <laughs> taking copious amounts of Tylenol. And uh, that went on, like I said, for about four years. And then around age 18 or so, I went to the OBGYN finally and about this. I mean, I've been before, but finally I thought, oh, well, maybe I should say something about this. And she immediately suggested that I go on the birth control pill because 
that was the solution to all of these problems and, <laughs> and really still is in conventional medicine. Uh, so I did. And I was excited because I thought, well, all the cool kids are on the pill. So I get to now be part of this lucky crew. Uh, and I, I remember her just whipping out her prescription pad and and like really not even blinking an eye and just saying like this is going to regulate your cycle so you're going to get your period every month it's also going to make your periods less heavy and you're going to probably not have any more period pain and i was just like are you kidding me this is a panacea this is the my magic bullet is what i've been waiting for and that really was what it was at that time i remember uh, turning 19, 20. And I was thinking, okay, this is really great. My periods are down to like two days. They're no longer seven or eight days long. I don't have any pain anymore. They're not heavy. Uh, this is awesome. And what happened was, or at least what I think happened was that my hormones sort of swung from one end of the spectrum to the other in that I had, I was probably, uh, estrogen dominant, meaning that my estrogen was dominant over my progesterone as a teenager, which isn't uncommon for teens. But uh, I went from that to having really low levels of sex hormones, because that's what the pill does. It basically stops ovulation. And so what happened is I went down, like my hormones were almost like at premenopausal levels by the time I came off the pill when I was about 23, 24 ish. And uh, by that time, I was having serious health problems. I had horrible gut issues. I My hair was falling out. I had melasma all over my face, which typically only happens during pregnancy. Um, I was stuck in a state of perpetual UTIs and yeast infections, which are a girl's worst nightmare in college because you know, you're trying to be having fun and be cool in college. That was not happening for me. And I distinctly remember there was sort of a breaking point for me. I ended up in the ER because I had an allergic reaction to my UTI medication. I was allergic to the whatever was in it. And I just remember thinking like, man, there's got to be a better way. And I really didn't find that for another year or so. And I ended up uh, seeing an acupuncturist, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner who was, I mean, a little old guy from China. He was amazing, but he immediately told me it was the pill that was causing all of these seemingly unrelated health problems. And I had, by that point, I had seen a gastroenterologist, I'd had a colonoscopy, I'd done tons of gut testing because they thought I had Crohn's disease potentially based on all the symptoms I was experiencing. And then I, I had seen a dermatologist for my face. <laughs> I was seeing my OBGYN like once every two weeks or two months because I had all of these chronic infections. So I was seeing all of these doctors and nobody ever uh, mentioned the pill. Anyway, fast forward, he thought it was the pill and it suggested I come off of it as soon as possible. And I was like, oh, I don't know about all this because you know when you've been on the pill for so long, this is basically your reality. It's stability. It means you're not getting pregnant anytime soon. So I just was a little terrified because I really had no clue what the hell was actually going on in my body to begin with. And finally, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to get off the pill. And I did. And he really helped guide me into what I should be eating and how I could start to track my cycle. It was hilarious. I mean, this guy knew more than most women my age at that time knew about a woman's menstrual cycle and, and how to uh, work with her body versus work against it. So I, I ended up working with him for a number of years and it really helped me get back on track. And I finally realized that I, you know, I'd studied film production in school. This was my dream. I was going to be in the movies, not in actual movies, but behind the scenes. And that was like, that was what I wanted to do. So I was working on commercials and I was working on a couple of films and it was amazing, but it was really burning me out. And I knew that now that I reclaimed my health, there was no way I could let it deteriorate to the point that I had when I was in my early 20s. And so I started to do more research about women's health and started to understand more about my body. And I, I basically did every different treatment you could find, you know, like all kinds of things. It's like vaginal steaming and you know, like everything you could possibly think of. Just, it was so out there and all my friends thought I was crazy, but it was amazing to experiment and figure out like what worked and what didn't and how it helped me and how it improved my health. And so finally I stumbled upon the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And at the time uh, they were only doing their live courses 
in New York City. And at the time I was living in Florida and I thought like, there's no way I could ever figure out how to have enough money to fly to New York once a month for six months. And so I just sort of tabled that idea for a bit, but it was always there at the back of my head. And then I met another graduate from IIN and she was teaching classes on holistic nutrition and I was so blown away by it. And so finally I decided I had to move to New York City in order to go to this school because it was it was 20 it was 2009 and 2010 was going to be their last live course and so I thought okay this is going to happen somehow some way. At the time I was married and I told my husband that we had to leave Orlando. I had to move to New York. This is what I'm doing. I don't know how we're going to do it but we got to figure this out. And somehow we did. I think we decided that in like May of 2009. And by September, we were in New York. So I ended up going to IIN in 2010. So that first half of 2010. And then I uh, apprenticed with another women's health expert. And I just knew like this was the work I was meant to do. I don't even know. It was just sort of indescribable. But this was truly my passion. I I felt like I was going to leave film production behind and I had to I had to continue to freelance in that world for a while before I got my business going, but it really was it became my mission to help women not go through what I had been through. So that's really my journey in a nutshell, a not so small nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> do you still live in New York? I do. Yes, I'm currently in Florida because I'm trying to get away from the cold, but I do <laughs> live in New York still. Yes, I love it. What part of Florida do you live in? Well, I'm not, I'm just in Florida or, on vacation, sorry. but I'm, yeah, Fort Lauderdale Fort and Lauderdale. in New York, I'm in Harlem. Got it. Well, I asked yeah. because uh, yeah, last night there was uh, w- on Facebook, there was warnings for Florida that they were dropping below zero or sorry, below, below zero Celsius, but below, <laughs> below 32, 32. Fahrenheit. Yeah. And for, you know, for, for the people that aren't in, in America, it's, it's uh, we, we say below zero, but, um, but it basically yeah. freezing. And I thought, man, Florida's freezing. Oh my gosh. And you got away, you tried to get away from the freezing in New York. That's funny. Girl, it's so bad. I mean, like it was 44, which I guess is about like maybe 10 Celsius and this morning. And I was like, come on, like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> the Floridians are completely freaking out. They're all in their winter boots and their jackets. And I'm still in flip flops because I'm like, well, it's Florida and it's sunny. So exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you can go to the beach now. You'll be the only one there. Pretty much. <laughs> I love that you went to IAN. I had the privilege of graduating last year from their online program. Um, I wonder how much of a difference the online program is versus what you got to experience. Um, it's I just loved it. I loved that, and I'm and I'm so grateful I didn't have to fly because I have a toddler and you know uh, yeah. just so many things I have to juggle. It's wonderful the education that you got, and I'm also really grateful that they were able to turn it into an online program. Um, I felt, I feel though, every time I, I took their videos, I felt like I was in the audience with them. They really, they did this amazing job of doing all the filming of all the, um, teachers and guest speakers so that you really felt like you were a part of it. Um, uh, so it's really cool mm-hmm. that you, uh, graduated as a coach from IIN. Now you went on to apprentice, uh, specifically around, um, women's health. What are some things that you learned as you were studying uh, health, specifically, you know, women's health and hormones, what were some things you learned that really surprised you, like um, myths that were completely busted wide open as you were um, exploring all of this content? Oh, so many. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, I did that apprenticeship and then I went on to do a women's health coach certification program in addition to my IIN health coach training. And I also uh, did a one year training program with Dr. Sarah Gottfried. And I feel like all of these training programs uh, subsequently led me to where I'm at right now. But man, there was so much that just blew me away. I think that, you know, one of the, one of my biggest problems when I was dealing with my own health problems at the time was the lack of answers and just the lack of uh, really lack of understanding about how a woman's body actually works and how her menstrual cycle works. And I kept asking these questions and kept not getting answers from the doctors I was speaking to. Nobody really had a why. And that was my mission was to really figure out 
why all this stuff was happening to me? Why is it happening to all of these other women? And what can we do about it? How can we be proactive in addressing the root cause? And so one of the things that I learned that was super eye-opening was how food is connected to our hormones and our period and how I, you know, if I eat a cookie, what, you know, like, what does that mean for my period? Or if I eat like a box of cookies, because usually a cookie is not a big deal. It's more like the box. Um, (laughs) But how does that um, impact your period, like your period pain or how heavy your period is? And I really couldn't understand or I really couldn't visualize that connection until I had done more training to, to really like get a clear understanding of it. And so that was like the big thing was, again, just feeling like, oh, I get it now that food is actually connected to our health. I mean, I I know it's like a no brainer to us now, but that's, I think, one of the biggest myths that's continue to be perpetuated that food is like has no bearing on our health. I mean, I can't tell you how many people who still come to me and say, yeah, my doctor was like, yeah, well, you know, this doesn't affect your thyroid or like vitamin D <laughs> levels don't affect your thyroid or uh, the you can eat all the cookies you want. It won't make a difference in your cancer diagnosis. I mean, like, it's just nuts what, you know, again, the myths out there. And so I think that that was the biggest one was really recognizing that connection. Mm-hmm. I think it's so funny. I've had a few MDs on the show, so medical doctors, right? And mm-hmm. they they have all said the same thing because, you know, they're not coming on my show if they're still thinking like an MD. <laughs> they yeah, have to have I had, hope not. <laughs> they have to have had some major revelation to end up on my show. But they've all said basically this, that this one particular MD said it and the rest of them have kind of um, said it in, in one way or another, but she said, listen, we, we pay as an MD, we pay so much for our education that we arrogantly expect that we've been taught everything there is mm-hmm. to know about healing and health and nutrition. So when we're only taught one class in our eight years, eight or you know more, if you're going to specialize, right? If you're going to become a cardiologist or something like that, there's more than eight years. But in over eight years of education, they have one class on nutrition, and they expect basically MDs have been you know trained, have been have been brainwashed to believe that that is all there is that is valuable, that is worth knowing. And and that there isn't possibly more information out there that is really crucial that they should know about because they paid so much for their education. So they obviously been taught only the best. Right. And yep. so you've got these like Harvard graduate doctors who really are arrogant in, in that it's because of the training. And if you, you know, if you want to get into a bit of the conspiracy theory of it, the allopathic medical training has been uh, funded by pharmaceutical companies for the last 150 years. Yep. And so they have systematically uh, weeded out holistic universities, universities that were teaching holistic doctors, and they 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 shut down a lot of those um, more holistic uh, minded um, university programs, uh, gearing it all towards allopathic pharmaceutical based medicine. And uh, you know, a, a, a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies can't make money if you're healthy. <laughs> so why would I they know, train but... the doctors to to perform how, like really uh preventive medicine right now to the doctor's credit there a lot of them are waking up and going wait a second i'm just a i'm just a drug pusher you know mm-hmm. i'm not actually getting results and so a lot of doctors end up getting frustrated or they themselves come up against a health problem and then their own medical system fails them and then they seek natural medicine to heal their problem. And then they have a big awakening. And so I've had a lot of doctors on the show who've kind of gone through that, um, where they end up healing their body with natural medicine. And then they go, wait a second, you know, I'm pushing drugs and I'm not actually healing anyone. And I really need to reevaluate what I'm doing. So luckily there are doctors waking up. But I, I love that you describe your experience working with fractionated MDs where one one of them puts you on a drug and then that causes a reaction so you have to go to a different one for the to handle that and then mm-hmm. you have these symptoms come up because of your the root cause of the problem but your symptoms are you know they're 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 showing up in your skin in your in your digestion in your you know in your in you know infections in certain areas and so you have to go to three separate doctors whereas it's actually just one problem 
And yep. holistic medicine, like holistic with a W, will look at you as a whole. And so a holistic practitioner, be it a health coach, uh, a, an acupuncturist, a naturopath, they will look at all your symptoms and go, okay, well, what's going on at the root cause? Like where, what can we do to help you balance your body? And I love that you brought up diet. I was the biggest myth that I was so surprised about that blew my mind was when I learned that we are, we're fat deficient, that uh, if we have hormone imbalance, that a lot of times we are not getting enough healthy fats because the fat, the healthy cholesterol is the building blocks of our sex hormones and our stress hormones. Do, do you have any information that you'd like to share with the listeners about, about that? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, I was... I'll never forget. I after I graduated from IIN, a friend of mine was working on these health immersions for Whole Foods and uh, for Whole Foods employees. And so we'd come down to Florida, and all these people would come. And it was uh, a more vegan centric uh, health immersion, and which is fine. But uh, I'll never forget one of the doctors saying to me uh, when they did because we you would do your testing and get your cholesterol and all these other things tested and. My cholesterol, my total cholesterol was like 110. It was nuts. I, my HDL, I think was like 55 and my LDL was also 55 wow, and so or something low. like that. Yeah. yeah. So low. Exactly. Right. Or 45 and 55 or something like that. It was nuts. And I'll never forget him saying to me, well, you're in luck because you're never going to have a heart attack. Oh. Meanwhile, <laughs> Meanwhile, like I can barely support my menstrual cycle because my hormones were so low. And that I think is another massive myth is this cholesterol thing. I mean, it's insane what is happening in the conventional medical realm around uh, cholesterol and cholesterol lowering drugs. And what I realized was that uh, I was not absorbing fat in the way that I needed to. And I certainly wasn't getting enough of it as well. So I needed to do massive work on my gut health to address the problem of malabsorption. And then I also needed to bring in plenty more of the healthy fats that I just wasn't consuming. And that completely changed my hormone profile and my cholesterol as a result went up. Uh, but I don't, you know, obviously don't pay attention to a lot of attention to the cholesterol numbers conventionally because they just, I don't know that they necessarily mean very much. Again, that doesn't mean everybody else should do what I do, but that's just my, been my own experience. But yes, like I see this so often where women are just not absorbing fat properly, or they're just not getting enough fat in their diet. And when I have them start when I have them work with me and start changing their food, it's really funny because they usually are like, wait, Nicole, you want me to eat how much fat? <laughs> I mean, it's just awesome. So it really is like a buildup, obviously, but I do find that that higher fat, higher protein, maybe a little bit lower carbohydrate diet works super well for women to help rebuild uh, their steroid sex hormones. Mm, absolutely. I've had a, a few cardiologists on the show and they have shared, I've had two cardiologists on the show, and both of them have said that um, people, for the most part, should stop taking cholesterol medication that's doing them no good. Uh, one of them said that only about 1% of the population that is currently taking cholesterol medication should actually take it. And the other cardiologist said the only time cholesterol medication is, is of benefit is after you've had your first heart attack. That there are wow. no, all, all the studies added up, actually, I've had three doctors confirm this, all the studies added up show that all the metadata says that taking cholesterol medication before a heart attack does no, actually will not prevent a heart attack. It actually causes a lot of damage because it, it, how cholesterol medication works is it bruises the liver to the point where the liver ceases to function correctly because the liver creates about mm. 30% of our needed cholesterol. And so, and so that, so basically lowers your cholesterol by maybe 30% because it is damaging the liver and stopping the liver to function correctly. And, you know, before I believe 2000, it was either 2011 or 2012, you can wiki this, it's, it's in, it's in wiki, but before 2012, you had to go in on a regular basis, like a monthly or, or a every second month basis to have your liver enzymes tested if you were on cholesterol medication 
because cholesterol medication, it, if if it's working correctly, it is damaging your liver. That's insane. And so, and and my mom died of liver cancer, and you you know how important the liver is. If you're you're damaging Absolutely, your liver, right? I mean, you know what's the point? And um and they've shown that tracking uh, triglyceride levels is 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 four times more effective in terms of anticipating a heart attack than cholesterol, right? Because the body is using cholesterol to patch something up. And if we go to the root cause, well, why is the body needing to patch up that area? It's because the body's deplete in the nutrients it needs um, and so to, to rebuild the healthy arterial wall. And so it's using cholesterol as a band-aid. So if we go back and go, okay, well, let's get more nutrients into us. Um, the cardiologists I've had on the show have both been able to completely reverse uh, build up plaque buildup in the heart. Wow. With diet and nutrition. Yep. And so, I mean, but for whatever reason, we're not, for whatever reason, that's like not something that is uh, catching on. <laughs> well, that's, there's one reason it's money. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> and I luckily, even, I don't even know why but, I said that. It's not like I'm surprised by this or anything. I know it. <laughs> right. No, no. But I mean, for, for it's, it's, we've got to keep sharing this information. That's why I wanted to touch on that. When you talked about cholesterol, so many people go, but cholesterol is bad, right? Because in the last 30 years, since they launched cholesterol medication, they've run a giant campaign to brainwash us into thinking that cholesterol is bad and fat is bad. So we grew up in the 80s thinking fat's bad. And we, we switched from, yeah. you know, we switched to a low fat diet, which is all, ultimately always a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet. And that's when all of a sudden our hormones started going like crazy, right? Can we, do you have any any stories or any information you want to share about like why is it that we're seeing more health problems now around around our hormones because my mom didn't have these problems my grandmother certainly didn't have these problems in fact if you if you could talk to your grandma or talk you know if you can know about your great grandma I've talked to naturopaths about this and they say you know your great grandparents they didn't they didn't go into menopause to their 70s like they like women didn't have these problems back when they ate uh you know when they grew their own food and then cooked it and then ate it and there's nothing processed so oh, girl. do you have yes. do you have information about um w w what it is why are we experiencing this problem so much more right now well, I think that there are a number of different factors that play into this, obviously, and I'm I'm continually in awe of my grandparents' generation and how long they lived and how easy it was for them to age. And they're just there was nothing like what we're experiencing now when it comes to this chronic disease epidemic. And I think that there are a couple of different things. First is that. And obviously, I, I talk mostly about women because that's usually the demographic I work with. So I, I'm aware of what they're up against. But I think one of the biggest problems is that right now women are under an unprecedented amount of physical, emotional, psychological stress, uh, something that we have never experienced literally in the history of our existence, and at least not uh, that we know of. Um, and we're at the point where it's almost like a breaking point, actually. And I often say this, and it's not to be gloom and doom, but it really is that I don't really think that our physiological makeup is designed by any means to exist uh, in a state of optimal health in this modern world. And that's a huge problem because we happen to live in the modern world. <laughs> so we have to be able to figure out some way to live in the world as it is right now and mitigate the effects of uh, the stress in our lives. So I think that that's one of the biggest problems is this, this chronic uh, psychological, like I said, emotional, physical stress. And so when I'm talking about physical stress, I'm talking about really, really cold climates or really, really hot climates and pol air pollution and uh, just a lot of like noise pollution and light pollution. So these are all real major problems for people, especially in big cities. And then, of course, the psychological and the emotional stress is just the, the insane burden that we have to bear. I mean, the, it's amazing. I was reading this article recently about uh, women and their role in in the family and whatnot. And, and just it was just shocking to see the stats on how women are still the primary caregivers 
for children, even though we also work one or two jobs and we also provide, you know, half of the income to our families in many cases. And sometimes we're the sole income provider. And yet the child rearing duties are still on, you know, still land on our plate for the most part. And so that hasn't changed. I mean, it has obviously, but it hasn't changed that dramatically, at least not to make up for the fact that we're also now working one or two jobs and we've got all of these other responsibilities that women just typically didn't have prior to the last like couple of decades. So I think that that's a big problem. Like we're just, we're juggling a lot of plates and we need to figure out how we can do a better job of mitigating the effects of that on our bodies. And then the second, oh, go ahead. Sorry, oh, I was just, say really? No, I was yeah. just going to say that um, for people who don't understand what, like everyone gets a stress is bad. Like, oh yeah, yeah, stress is bad, whatever. But could you talk about the physiological impact that stress has on the body. So why is it that stress causes a period or a period to be irregular? Like what mechanism yes. does stress uh, have on the body? So that I, mean, I think it's a bit of a motivator when people understand, well, why, why is it that I should really take the time in my day to practice um, de-stressing, to practice active relaxation and if they understand that the impact of not doing it, you know, so maybe if you could just explain how the body works in that way. Of course. So I should say, I should have prefaced all of this by saying that, you know, stress is sort of, it's so ubiquitous and it's one of those terms that I think people are just numb to at this point. And mm -hmm. so I typically use the term chronic overstimulation because mm. that's really what it is. And we are all chronically overstimulated. So that's really what I'm referring to when I talk about stress. So we'll just, we'll scratch that stress word. But when we're in this state of chronic overstimulation, what happens is basically our brains are being hijacked. And what that looks like is, so we have this external or sometimes internal, because I was going to talk about that too, this like blood sugar roller coaster or food sensitivities or gut inflammation that's causing our bodies to respond in a in a stressful way what happens is uh, we have this external stimulation overstimulation and that's an ongoing thing for most people and so what happens is our hypothalamus interprets that and then says to our pituitary gland you need to talk to the adrenal glands and tell them to output cortisol or epinephrine or whatever stress hormone, stress response hormone there is, and keep doing that until I tell you not to do it anymore, until we're out of danger. And what happens there is that we end up in this chronic state of fight or flight, right? Our bodies are just constantly in the, they're in the alarm mode or alarm stage, and the switch has been flipped and they can't, it doesn't, it just doesn't turn off. So for so many of us, that's a huge problem. Women, unfortunately, because of our physiological makeup, because we make babies, because we have a menstrual cycle, we are more prone to the effects of that stress response that's happening. It's not great. Uh, I hate to admit it, but we just are. <laughs> and so what then happens is uh, those adrenal glands, which are also talking to your other glands in your endocrine system, are just in that output mode, right? So they're producing cortisol or another stress hormone. And uh, those are like the life and death hormones. So our body views that as taking precedence over the production of any other hormone. And so what happens, unfortunately, is that our thyroids begin to struggle, our ovaries begin to struggle, because our adrenals take precedence, like I said. So what will happen is, if there are higher levels of cortisol, like coursing through our veins, pregnenolone, which is sort of a mother hormone for our sex hormones, can become depleted. And because pregnenolone and cortisol and progesterone, which is one of our sex hormones, they all sort of come down the same pathway. And so if we're constantly producing stress hormones, our body is like, oh, okay, we're just going to divert some of that pr pregnenolone production towards cortisol. And we'll just like let progesterone figure it out for herself. <laughs> and so <laughs> what then happens is our ovulation potentially starts to falter. We end up in a state more of a state of estrogen dominance over our progesterone. Uh, we end up with heavier periods, sometimes painful periods, or our periods disappear completely. It just sort of depends on our genetic makeup. Like some women lose their periods, others end up just having really heavy 
periods that come more frequently. And so that is that's a sort of an end result, but that's basically what you start to see. You start to see irregular periods, and that's usually a sign that uh, ovulation is faulty. And when you think about evolution and what our bodies did for probably millions of years, when we interpreted, when our brains interpreted an external stressor like a saber-toothed tiger <laughs> or some kind of animal chasing us or uh, there was a famine or there was some other danger, uh, our body would basically shut down ovulation. So that chronic stress state shuts down ovulation. It says, you're not safe to have a baby right now, so we're going to delay or stop ovulation this cycle. And that's basically what's happening to women now, except that we don't really have any real danger necessarily. It's just that our bodies and our brains don't really know the difference between being chased by a saber tooth tiger or, uh, you know, having a really crappy day at work every single day of your life. And so this is just sort of an ongoing problem that we're all dealing with. And so if you're, you've got to figure out like what your stress threshold is, because I think some of us are obviously more prone to the effects of that chronic overstimulation than others are. And so we, we really have to develop resilience. We also have to figure out like where that threshold is, because like I said, you know it though, like we all know it, like, you know, when you're starting to feel a little sniffly or your neck pain or back pain is like really flaring up. Like, you know, you're getting to that point where you're about to burn out and you need to start to make uh, preparations or remediate the, the problem. And so that's really why I think it's so critical for women, especially because of our delicate hormonal makeup to really pay attention to the stress in their lives. I love that you pointed out that um, when we're under chronic stress, the body, it's like it goes into survival mode. And yeah. and the problem with that is that by stimulating, by constantly stimulating the the paras, the autonomic nervous system's sympathetic response, a being in fight or flight, is that it's shunting blood away from the logic centers of the brain, shunting blood away from our digestion, our core, and our immune system, and shunting the blood towards our limbs so that we can we can run. But the problem mm -hmm. is that if done chronically, uh, we're, we're basically giving a minimal amount of oxygen and nutrients to our brain and to our immune system and to our digestive tract and exactly. to our organs. And so, yeah. you know, besides losing your um, ovula ovulation, which is, you know, it makes sense because if we're in chronic stress, we shouldn't, it's not optimal time to have a kid. Um but really. the, pro the problem is that then our body is not in healing mode. It's not going to repair the damage. So if like uh, we have some kind of inflammation going on in the gut, it's just going to continue over a long period of time and continue causing scar tissue and damage, which a long, long term inflammation causes scar tissue and that causes damage um, in and of itself. And so so we're we're losing ground in our health tremendously by staying in stress mode. And I think that we have really adapted to tolerate high stress because stress isn't an emotion. So a lot of people, I, I brought this up with a client of mine and she's like, but I don't feel stress. I'm like, okay, first of all, I like listed 10 things in her life that, um, <laughs> that, that would like make anyone like want to cuddle it, it with their blanket. You know I mean? It's just like, <laughs> like she is going through some major, major stuff in her life. And it, but she says, I don't feel stress. Well, stress isn't an emotion. What you feel is the, the end result of stress being done to you over time. And by that, that time you feel it, it's too late. Like you said, when you start to feel tension in your shoulders, most people don't have the awareness of their body until their body's breaking. So yep. they, you need, this is a lot of nature paths that come on the show and share this, like, listen to the symptoms of your body. Like, don't negate it. Like, Oh, you have tense shoulders, but you're like, but I have a deadline, but I have to get home. I got to drive through this traffic. I got to make dinner for the kids. I got to put the kids to bed. And, I, and you're like, you make that as an excuse for why you don't need to take care of yourself right now. And what we do is we put our needs aside. You feel like you get it. Maybe you have a headache. So you take some Advil. Well, that headache was a symptom of, of, of your ill-managed stress or, exactly. you know, or you end up getting, um, tendonitis, you end up getting a, a shoulder, shoulder pain, you end up getting tension headaches, you, you know, th there's so many things that that are, are symptoms of your body breaking. 
in and and so it's like if you imagine the stress you'd put on a piece of wood as you're bending it like a twig as you're bending it you hear it start to snap and you hear it start to like just crackle and break and eventually it snaps all together but the the little crackles as as you're twisting that branch or like your, your tension headache or your shoulders getting tight or your, you know, your back pain flaring up or your, maybe your ulcer flaring up. Like, like that is just the early warning signs. And then people like I've had a guest on the show that had such bad stress that she didn't manage that she fainted. Like she just, her body just said, I'm done, faint, shut down. And so our body can do that. If you're under too much stress, you can just faint and you could seriously hurt yourself. So Mm -hmm. I just, I wanted to paint that full picture because I think it's so important. A lot of women go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stress, whatever. I'll, I'll handle it. You know, when I retire, (laughs) I'll handle it. I'll handle it after I'm done paying taxes. I'll handle it after like we, we put it (laughs) off and put it off and put it off. I'm like, the problem is, is that the longer we live in this state of like not having a regular period, we're actually shaving years off of our life, right? Because isn't there a relationship? Maybe you could talk about this. Isn't there a correlation between healthy hormone levels and longevity? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Actually, I was just reading yesterday about this, about women who have had an oophorectomy, which is where your ovaries are removed prior to menopause, like when you're still technically in your reproductive er- years, I uh, have um, a much higher incidence of, of premature death. And uh, so, and it's because of, um, and dementia, sorry, not only that, but dementia, like on early onset dementia and Alzheimer's and then death. Uh, and that's because, uh, you're losing, first of all, your ovulation, which then triggers the production of these really protective hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And they both play a role in long-term brain health. And, So when we have that, when we lose those hormones, we run into serious problems. I mean, that's just one example of it. I mean, they play a role as well in your heart health and your bone health. So it's just like the list goes on and on. And we have to be so cognizant of that before we go operating willy nilly on our uh, female reproductive organs, because they, you know, that's another thing that tends to happen is they they usually uh, hysterectomy is is suggested for a woman who has endometriosis or a woman who has uh, really heavy periods or adenomyosis, which is another condition that causes very heavy periods. And so it's just amazing to me how quickly we jump to, well, let's just remove that organ and don't <laughs> really realize how what a downstream effect that particular organ and its hormones have on our overall health and our longevity. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm just so amazed at the hubris of the MD that a children who have ear infections, the MD solution is, well, let's go put them under, which is a major surgery and children have died uh, from mm-hmm. this. It's so sad, but they put them under and they put, you know, they, they take out their adenoids and their tonsils and, and, and they oh. put in, um, these tubes in the, in the, the ear canal, right? So in the, in the ear, ear, and, uh, that is their solution. And it is so damaging because you're, they're taking out a part of the body that experiences the symptom. They're not, they're not, they're not addressing the root cause. Most naturopaths, uh, like what they do is they just have the parents remove cow dairy from the child's life. And immediately the problem goes away because the body was reactive. The body was saying, hey, this food is not good for my immune system. And so the adenoids and the tonsils were, were, were kicking up, were flaring up. And then the inflammation was causing the um, like the inguinal tube that goes to the um, the ear canal to, 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 to swell. And then the ears were getting, you know, pain and then, you know, fluid. And then that fluid led to infection. And MDs, can you believe this? The medical doctors that we send our kids to, their solution is just cut it out. Just cut it oh out. When it's all you so had to upsetting. do was, was remove dairy. And then chiropractors have had amazing experience with adjusting children. And immediately, the the because they do this proper adjustment of, of the cervical spine, that, that it opens up the tubes again. Because the ear, if you don't know the anatomy, the, the, not you, but if the listener doesn't know the anatomy, mm-hmm. the, the inner ear, um, or it's the middle ear, but the part of the ear, not the outer ear, the part of the, the, the tube of the ear drains to, into the throat. And right. um, that's why you can blow your, you can hold your mouth, blow your nose and, um, <laughs> and, ha- like an, and, and have your ears pop to equalize if you're getting on an airplane. Um, 
but a chiropractors have great success in it, you know, just adjusting a child's neck and then, then the, that ear pain goes away and the, the ears can drain and the, in, the body handles the infection. And so we've got natural medicine, which handles it so uh, affordably and so holistically and so gently and actually getting to the root cause. And then we have medical doctors that want to do major surgery that is life threatening. And not address the root issue. And, oh, yeah, on a small child. And uh, and also put them on lots of antibiotics, which, of course, you know, sets them up for a life, lifelong issues with their gut um, dysbiosis. Uh, yes. So MDs... And period problems. R- I mean, like, really? you know how many times I... Yeah, dairy, like, A1 casein and dairy and just having from dairy, like... I have women remove dairy all the time because of horrible period pain, heavy periods, endometriosis. So from the, they, and usually what I do is I ask like, were you on a lot of antibiotics as a kid? Did you have air infections? Mm. Did you have sinus problems or chronic colds? And usually they did. And I'm like, well, so what happens is that you kind of outgrew the symptoms that you were experiencing, but you did not grow the allergy to it or the sensitivity to it. And now mm-hmm. it's just showing up in a whole other way as an adult woman. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. So what you don't know about me, what you may not know about me is I had um, fertility issues. Uh, I had very, like you, same story as you, very heavy periods as a, as a teenager, just like curling over, couldn't go to school, a very embarrassing moments where I had with, when I was with my boyfriend and I had to like borrow an, a pair of pants, you know, because oh, of, yeah, it was so, so hard, yeah, very embarrassing. <laughs> right, yeah. And, um, and then, and I thought that was normal. And then I went to a doctor and he put me on the pill. Same thing is, as you said. And then I went to an endocrinologist and the endocrinologist when I was 19 said you will never have children that I had polycystic oh. ovarian syndrome and I would never have children that was it right and so um when I married my husband um that we're coming into our 10th year of marriage and we tried na- naturally we didn't go like the you know MD route but we just you know had fun trying um (laughs) is how he Mm -hmm. likes to put it um for six years and um and then that's when I stumbled upon seven years ago is when I stumbled upon natural medicine and and hold it like really re I refound holistic medicine because when I was a kid my mom had me see a naturopath which which um he got me off of dairy when I was six years old uh I saw Dr. Diadamo the guy that wrote the book uh, eat right for your blood type Yes. And he took me off of, he said, you, he took my, he did my iridology. So he looked at my eyes. He took my blood. He said, you are allergic to milk, yeast, wheat, and sugar. You have to stay off of it. And so from age six to age 13, I actually obeyed what he said. And I had perfect health and I was never sick. And then I was 13. I totally rebelled and started eating crap food, the cafeteria food, <laughs> drinking milk, you know, basically what the standard, well, Canadian diet, but standard American diet, same thing. <laughs> And, uh, and that's when my health totally went down the toilet and I've spent my entire adult life now trying to get it back. So, so what's, what's funny is that, um, I had the dairy problem, so I got rid of dairy and, um, and in the last seven years, uh, I've been studying with naturopaths and I was able to, with natural medicine, with diet and supplements, uh, I was able to hundred percent reverse my fertility problems and the, the polycystic ovarian syndrome and now we have a two-year-old. He's about to be three in March. And <laughs> so it's so cool that um, natural medicine uh, can com- do, is the real medicine. I mean, it, it is what healed me. No, all the MDs I went to, all the specialists and the endocrinologists, they all said, sorry, give up, just stay on the pill, you're done. And it was holistic <sighs> medicine that said, uh-uh, I don't think so. I love that story so much. It's so good. It's just, to me, it's a perfect example of really just not accepting the status quo and empowering yourself to really get to the root cause of what was happening and and completely transforming your life. It's so awesome. I love it. One, this is what you do with your clients. That's why I wanted to share because it works. Natural medicine works. Diet Mm -hmm. works. This is what actually works. Getting on drugs. Listen, now drugs have their place. Right. I'm not I'm not I I really I want to stress that I'd rather someone be on a life saving drug than like let their principles, you know, end end their life. Um, I'd rather someone get on a drug if they if they absolutely need it. And and sometimes even just short term, um, like uh, like I want to talk to you about about bioidentical hormones, because even though that isn't that's still considered a drug or a supplement, um, Mm -hmm. I think it has its place. What do you think? What are your thoughts on bioidentical hormones? 
Well, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, because I'm a health coach, I don't, I can't obviously prescribe them. And so I always refer clients out if that's something that they're interested in exploring. But I have a couple of thoughts on it, on them. I think the first thing is that when it comes to having hormones that are dysregulated or imbalanced, really like what we've just been talking about, feel like we're banging that drum is the whole, like, you've got to look at the root cause. You've got to figure out what's happening with the food that you're eating. You've got to figure out your chronic overstimulation. So there's a lot of different factors that you have to address. I think personally, before jumping into uh, hormone replacement therapy, I think that that's, that's pretty critical. And so when you have that in place, as your foundation, then I think you could explore hormones. And I, you know, I don't have anything against them by any means, but what I think has happened for a lot of women is that they're just, that's almost like step number one, where they're put on progesterone. Usually it's progesterone because we have a bit of an epidemic of progesterone deficiency these days. As I mentioned, when I was talking about that stress response and and how it impacts our pregnant alone and then our, our progesterone. And so what I think happens is uh, women are put onto progesterone and they're not put onto it in the right way or they're not given the right dosage. I think you just have to be working with a very skilled practitioner when it comes to this. But even then, it's really difficult, right? Because you're sort of guessing what this person and their unique body is going to need in terms of their the hormone that you're giving them, when in actuality, all of our bodies produce different amounts of hormones on any given day. Uh, and if we're ovulating, then we'll e produce even more different amounts. So it's really kind of challenging to guesstimate what, what type of hormone or how much that person needs. Um, and so when I also see a lot of situations where women are taking progesterone in that first half of their cycle, which can actually interrupt ovulation, it can prevent ovulation from happening. So you really want to be cognizant of that too, and, and really only be taking progesterone if that's what you are taking, uh, after you've confirmed that ovulation has happened. So only in that second half of your cycle, otherwise, like I said, you could potentially prevent or hinder ovulation from occurring. And, and that's really not the goal at all. You want to be ovulating. Uh, the other thing that I was going to say too, is that I find that, like I was saying before about the amounts that you're taking, it's really challenging, right? Because your endogenous hormone production varies so much that what I've seen a lot of is a woman is taking a progesterone or maybe even a testosterone for low sex drive and they end up just having too much and it causes like the opposite of what you really wanted it to do. And like, for instance, too much progesterone can cause depression. It can even cause heavy periods. Uh, it, you know, so it can cause skipped ovulation, like I just mentioned. So you just have to be really careful, I think. So those are just a few of my own personal thoughts around it. Again, I think everyone just has to do what feels right for them, but I, I don't ever recommend it as, as a first line of defense when it comes to addressing imbalanced hormones. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a very uh, well thought out answer, especially because what we want to do is get to the root cause. I mean, if someone wants to address some symptoms with bioidentical hormones in the short term, that's wonderful, but really it's not going to, taking a bioidentical hormone isn't getting to the root cause. It's just managing it. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Dr. John Lee. He sort of has been, he was the uh, pioneer of progesterone, of bioidentical progesterone. Uh, unfortunately, he's passed away, but his work is outstanding. Um, there's a talk on uh, YouTube you can find. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes where he discusses his findings over, over 30 years of using uh, bioidentical progesterone for women um, that are menopausal and postmenopausal yes. in terms of bone density he was able to reverse osteoporosis uh with a uh, bioidentical progesterone and mm. he was just going to all the doctors and all the conferences and they all poo-pooed him and he's like look this is my findings and they all said no 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 estrogen's where it's at everyone gets on estrogen and he's like absolutely not you guys are crazy it's it's all about the progesterone and so <laughs> he he was the first one to really uh, ring that bell um and he has a very interesting, interesting story about that. Uh, yeah. it's, it's amazing how something like our hormones, like one hormone 
can be the, be the difference between our mental health in our senior years or our bone density in our senior years. And that's just one hormone. And I mean, it's not only in your senior years, like what I'm running into so often now, which is so frightening is really young women who are dealing with amenorrhea, which is when you have no period or even premature ovarian failure, where your ovaries stop functioning the way they're supposed to function in your reproductive years. And what then happens is uh, you're obviously not ovulating or your ovulation is so sporadic that you're just not producing enough estrogen and progesterone to support your, your body or your bone health or your brain health. And so there's like a whole host of issues that come with that. And uh, a lot of this stems from women who have been on long-term, on the birth control pill for a long-term uh, or long period of time. And that, I mean, is is also to me in like, at epidemic levels. And maybe that's because I do this work. And so a lot of women come to me or reach out about this, but that's another problem too, is that it's actually, uh, it's spanning all decades of a woman's life now. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've, you, you, you have women come to you with a variety of problems. You mentioned the amenorrhea and uh, we've talked a little bit about polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, what about, uh, the other, the other issues are, do you treat them all the same, uh, in terms of like, okay, let's, let's look at diet, let's look at nutrition. Um, or does each one have a, have a different way of approaching it? I think that the first thing that I do with women, again, like we've talked about is that we really work on fine tuning their diet and, and figuring out what's working, what's not working and what foods you really should be eating and what foods you shouldn't be eating. And that I think is the foundational aspect. And across the board, I really just want to make sure that that's in place. And, and then we start to uh, really become discerning about what other steps can be taken based on the actual root cause of their problem. So if there is a thyroid issue happening, for instance, then we'll, we'll tailor their uh, protocol to um, addressing that underlying thyroid problem. So we really want to make sure vitamin D is in place and magnesium and also like the trace mil minerals. I mean, that again, this is across the board for pretty much everyone, but you really want to be focused on that for someone with a thyroid problem. But I would say in 90% of my cases with clients, uh, they all need the same thing, at least initially, at least for the first eight to 12 weeks of working together, everyone needs to just do follow the same steps. And I think what a lot of women run into, I run into this is that they think that their problem is so unique. They've likely been told that by their doctor, like, I've never seen a case like this, or this is so unique, or yeah, this is a weird one, or this is like a crazy case. I mean, they say the most ridiculous things to these women. And they're just, I mean, they're so, as you said, like at 19, you were told you would never have children. I have a lot of friends and a lot of clients who've been told something similar at 14. I have a friend who was diagnosed with PCOS and told the same thing. And it's just ridiculous. Anyway, really gets me mad. But I, I think that we're sort of, we've been conditioned to believe that we have this really unique health problem. I, I thought the same about my own health issues. Everyone was like, I can't, I just can't believe all that you're going through. You're so young. This can't be right. Like I've never seen anything like this before, or this is a really strange case or whatever. And so because we've been told all these things and this has been perpetuated, we have this idea that either um, we're going to, it's going to take a great deal of intervention to fix our problem, or it's going to be very difficult or, uh, maybe Nicole doesn't totally know like how crazy this, this problem is. And maybe she can't help me. Like a lot of people are really skeptical that food and maybe a few targeted supplements and really just sort of working on your lifestyle can have such a profound effect. And I think it's because again, we've been conditioned to believe that it's going to take a great deal of medical intervention to address our problems. And so I'm all, I'm all about this idea that, uh, you, it, it, you can fix your period with, with ease and it, there's, it's not as challenging as we've let, been led to believe. That, that message of hope is really important because I felt really hopeless for so many years and the MDs made me feel that way. They, 
they said, you know, no, this is the, they, they're the authority. We go to them and they're this giant authority over our body and over our health. And yes. then when they tell you this diagnosis, it's, it's a, it's a death sentence. It's a life sentence. You're, you're now sentenced. You're now chained a ball and chain to this diagnosis and they give you little hope. Um, and, and they, a lot of MDs end up getting really upset when you, when you seek natural medicine. I've had, I've had a lot of clients come to me who they reverse their diabetes, for example, using natural medicine. That's another thing that I reverse using natural medicine. And so they reverse their diabetes. They go back to their doctor that was just managing their diabetes over many years. And the doctors kind of get upset because it's like, <laughs> how dare you? Like, how dare yeah. you um, prove Take that- your health into your own hands. <laughs> right. And how do you prove that like my education is flawed, that my- <laughs> you know, that my system is flawed. It's their ego gets in the way. So you don't let someone's ego get in the way of your health. I think a really important thing to do is if you're working with a doctor or any healthcare professional, you're the boss, you hired them, they work for you. And if they can't be humble and be on your team, um, and, and if, if they can't help you to look for all the possible solutions, you know, then you need to like look elsewhere. It's okay to fire your doctor or fi fire your whatever healthcare professional and seek one that is going to get you results. And, and, and none of this, you got to be on this one thing for the rest of your life. You got to be on this one drug for the rest of your life. And that's, you know, there's very few cases where that's actually true. <laughs> Most Amen, of the time, <laughs> right? Most of the yeah. time, these, these, these prescriptions are, they're, they're over, they're over prescribed. And so that's why it's like, let's, let's go to a few, um, other doctors and other healthcare professionals and, and get a second opinion. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the success you've had with some of your clients. That's something I want to definitely address. Um, because I go to the praise section of your website and I can't find the bottom of it. Like there's hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of really cool, uh, testimonials. Um, that are, I mean, they're, they're, again, this has to do with the hope message, you know, if, if a woman has been given a sentence like fiber, um, like uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, like endometriosis, and it is painful, it's painful, it's so painful to have endometriosis. I know a woman that goes in to have her uterus uh, ablate, ablation done where they like basically burn the lining of her uterus with a laser. Oh, oh. And, yeah. and that's the, because otherwise she has, um, periods that are so heavy and so painful that she can't function half of the month, but that isn't addressing the root cause. There's a reason why that's happening. And so she's, she still has ill health underneath that. That's just a band aid. but because the MD isn't going to offer any other choices, she doesn't know that those choices are available. And so the, those who are listening are like, wait a second, I don't have to have polycystic ovarian syndrome. I don't have to have heavy periods. I don't have to have irregular periods. You know, I, I don't have to have infertility. Like I can fix this. I can reverse this. And so to see all of the messages of hope, all of these stories of success of the clients you worked with is really powerful because the first thing we have to do is shift our mindset. When it comes to our healing, we have to shift our mindset and realize that yes, we can heal. The body is a miracle. The body mm. grew itself it divided into you know, 37 trillion cells from just, from just two little tiny, in, tiny microscopic cells, you know? And, <laughs> and so it's amazing if we can do that, then, then we can absolutely heal. So we've got to get that message of hope. So I love that you shared that. I'd, I want you to address some actionable steps that we can take today. So you say that for the most part, you have, um, you sort of have a, have a basic kind of fun, fundamental, fundamental, you have a basic <laughs> foundational, I want to say fundamental and foundational at the same time. Yes. I think I just invented a new word for 2018, um, called Webster's Dictionary. So a, a, a foundational program for your clients. Can you share that with us? Like what, what dietary and lifestyle changes can we make today? And all of us see some real great health benefits by doing these changes. Yeah, I, I think that one of the first things I actually have women start doing, aside from the food stuff, which we'll get to, is starting to become an expert on their bodies. Because clearly, we have missed the mark when it comes to sex education and body literacy understanding and all of these really amazing topics. Because Every woman who comes to me, myself included, has not a clue about what is going on with her body. Like they, She doesn't understand what ovulation is. She doesn't really get 
like why she gets a period or how, what her period is actually supposed to look like. I mean, there's just so many things. Like a lot of women don't even realize that you can actually get pregnant only on one to two days out of your entire menstrual cycle. And yet we're taking a potentially carcinogenic birth control pill every single day, whereas men are fertile every single day of the year and they don't have any responsibilities when it comes to birth control. So there is there is a serious problem there as far as I'm concerned. And I obviously take, I have draw a hard line with this because I feel that I was totally gypped. I went to Catholic high school. I did Christian family life education because they couldn't bring themselves to say sex education. <laughs> so <laughs> I totally get this, but I really think that we're missing a major amount of information here. And so as a result, what I have women start to do is understand their bodies. So we start by learning about the four phases of your cycle, your menstrual cycle. And I share all about uh, the bleeding phase, which is that first phase. And then we go into the follicular phase, the ovulatory phase, and then the luteal phase. And so these, all these phases are dominated by uh, different hormones and hormonal fluctuations. And as a result, our, we're, we're kind of different every week of the month, actually. Like we, our bodies are different and physically and emotionally, we're, uh, we're doing things differently. We're thinking differently. So I think that that's the first step is starting to chart your cycle, meaning that you get an app and you put in that first day of your period and you start to put in symptoms that you're experiencing, whether that's uh, a change in your cervical fluid, because your cervical fluid is very hormone dependent, and it changes according to how much estrogen you're producing and how much testosterone and how much progesterone you're producing. So throughout the month, it looks different. There's a different cervical p- fluid profile for each week of your cycle. Uh, so we look at those changes. We look at uh, your cravings, breast tenderness, bloating, uh, acne, uh, any tiredness, fatigue, mood swings, all of these things are put into that app. And I, I want women to do that for at least three months so that they can start to really understand how their bodies work. And it's miraculous. I mean, it is so amazing to get feedback around this because again, we've been in the dark for so long and across the board, every single woman has said some variation of, I cannot believe that I have gotten to this age, whatever that age is. Usually it's 25 to 45 and nobody has ever told me this information. (laughs) This is crazy. This is a crime against humanity. And it really is because we would be able to save so much pain and trauma if we were, if we had this information. So that's really the first step. I think with, at least with my clients, that's what we do. This, it reminds me of, um, we sort of still live in the fifties, like leave it to beaver. <laughs> it's like, we yes. don't talk about a woman's cycle. Like that's so, you know, that's, it's like potty talk. Right. And mm. I love that Oprah empowered women by bringing menopause to the forefront, but to, to like, let's talk about it. Let's, because when she was going through it, pre-menopause and it, and no one knew about it. Like that's not something you talked about or knew about. And, you know, doctors typically don't sit down and, and so the root cause of the, sorry, the root word the, the, for doctor is doceri, which means teacher. Do, our doctor the, literally mm. is supposed to be our teacher. <laughs> and now they're yeah. just a, they're just a prescription pad holder. So we're gonna have to find a new Latin word for that um, <laughs> and just start calling them the prescription pad holder because they're not being our teacher. What really so this conversation needs to shift. We need to start learning about ovulation and our cycle and the foods that that contribute to our health around our hormones because that equals our brain health and our longevity and and uh, basically hormones because they bathe every single cell in the body uh, affects every single cell in the body. So we need to take this really seriously. What kind of dietary shifts? Um, can we make like, what kind of just, I know everyone's different. Like I totally get bio individuality, but is there Mm -hmm. some kind of like fundamental, like you're like, everyone would benefit from eating this or everyone would benefit from making this kind of shift or looking at their diet in this way? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes, definitely. And I think that we're probably on a similar page, especially because we both went to IIN and the idea really is to figure out how to bring in more nutrient dense foods into your diet 
food that is really going to nourish you on a deep level versus food that is going to just give you a quick fix, quick high, (laughs) and then leave you feeling even more depleted in a couple hours. And so what I have, I, my, one of my very first recommendations is always to think about all the green vegetables in the world and choose a few of them that you really love and start to have that every day of your diet. Just even if it's one serving once a day, I bring that in. I've had so many women do that and they have all these amazing changes. It's just hilarious. They're like, Nicole, I did nothing else but this and it's helped so much. And so I think that that's the first thing. So the dark leafy green vegetables, the cruciferous veggies, because cruciferous vegetables are, I think, so critical for women's health because they contain compounds that help to uh, reduce estrogen dominance, right? So they're going to help your body process estrogen better. And it's so, so important, I think, for us to to think about having that, you know, the kale and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and uh, the mustard greens and the collards and all of those that are, again, like I said, those cruciferous vegetables. Uh, So we need to focus on that. And I think we need to really think about our fat intake. I know we talked about this. I grew up in the 80s, 90s, so I 100% get what you're talking about with this low-fat insanity. And it's carried over into this decade still. I'm like, how is this myth still being perpetuated? This is killing me. And yet here we are uh, with people doing low-fat diets and doctors still recommending low-fat diets. And it's, it's so, so detrimental to us. And so like I'd said to you earlier, you know, I see a lot of women with amenorrhea or very irregular periods. And what that means is either you're not ovulating or your ovulating is very sporadic. And ovulation is quite an energy intensive uh, act that our bodies undergo every single month, at least we'd like them to. And so what happens is uh, when we're not give, giving our bodies enough nutrients, then we're just unable to ovulate consistently. So when we're com- uh, consistently undernourished. So what what we need to do is figure out how to bring in more fat into our diet. So I'm a big fan of uh, coconut oil and coconut butter and the animal proteins and fatty fish that's hopefully wild caught uh, and nuts and seeds, especially the seeds. I, I recommend seed cycling for a lot of women too, who have irregular periods or no period. And it, it works tremendously well. And I, I can give you the link to the seed cycling protocol I have on my site, but it's really, really helpful for a lot of women in that uh, you're alternating different types of seeds in the first half of your cycle and then the second half of your cycle. And if you don't have a cycle, you just follow the moon phases. And uh, it's brought back cycles in many occasions. It's also helped a number of people get their uh, periods more uh, in a 28 to 35 day range or their cycles in a 28 that's, to 35 that's day very range. very exciting. That's so exciting. What What is it in the seeds that does it? Is Are the seeds... Uh uh, stimulating different hormones? Like how does it, how does that work? Yeah, basically. So essentially what it is, is you're, you're, so you're counting from day one of your cycle and you're doing, um, pumpkin and flax seeds. So you do a tablespoon of each, you grind them up and you take a tablespoon of each one for that first half of your cycle. So you do day one to day 14. And then, um, the second half from day 15 to day 28, you do sesame and sunflower seeds. So you grind those up and you take a tablespoon each day of each one. And so the idea here is that uh, it helps your body naturally rebalance the levels of these sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, uh, with these seeds. And so apparently, and again, I, there's no real science on this, and this is really just more of an, I, I can't say ancient technique, but it's an older technique. And for whatever reason, it works. But the idea is that The seed hulls contain lignans, especially the flax, uh, which of course are, are, they help bind up any excess hormones in our body. And then the seed oils contain essential fatty acids that seem to provide these building blocks for making hormones. And I don't know what it is, but it works. It's amazing. (laughs) So I've had a lot of really great success with women who are, even like women who have heavier periods, this can be really helpful too. Uh, for for reducing the the length of the period and and the heaviness 
uh, or the, even the pain of periods too. So it's, it's been helpful for a number of different issues. Okay, we'll put the link to that in the show notes, but I have a few more questions. So um, yeah. what's the, can we just buy the flax ground already or is there a benefit to having the whole seed and then grinding it ourselves? I find there's a benefit just because flax tends to be a bit of a volatile seed. And well, I mean, all the seeds really, but flax in particular. And so it can go rancid really fast. And that's why I just recommend people using uh, like a coffee grinder and just grinding up their seeds right when, when they're going to have them. I totally get that. When I, when we were seeing Dr. Diadamo, when I was a kid, he had us do flax every day. He had this like crazy drink we had for breakfast and it was, he had us uh, squeeze fresh grapefruit and then grind our own flax seed in a, in a coffee grinder and then add water and his um, plant-based protein powder uh, in a bl- blender. And that was our um, breakfast every morning. And it made us very regular. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because lots of flax. Um, oh, yeah. It was, it was wonderful. And I was just, I remember I would let it sit. I was a kid, right? I grew up on this. And I let it sit long enough for it to congeal and then I would just drink it in one gulp and I would like just slide the whole protein shake would just slide down my throat like (laughs) jello it was actually like really it's actually really enjoyable it's not that probably sounds gross but um I thought that it was cool it's kind of like chia seeds you know uh, when you uh let chia seeds soak it kind of becomes this jello um what are your thoughts on chia seeds there's you know a great um, omega-3 profile, do you find that they're also uh, beneficial? Yeah, I, I, that's another one too. I recommend chia seeds as well. I think people just need to be careful if there's any kind of inflammatory bowel disease or inflammatory bowel issue in general, uh, because it seems that chia seeds can exacerbate that. But again, I, I like I have said before, you know, I'm a, this such a big proponent of women really tuning into their bodies because, of course, we've been told for so long not to do that, and we've come so we've moved so far away from that intuition around what actually works for us and what feels good for us. And so I'm constantly working with women to bring them back to that place of of deep knowing what and wisdom or, or deep knowing of what their body's wisdom is and what it's trying to tell us at all times. And a lot of cases I've had where, or I've had a lot of cases where uh, women say that chia seeds sort of exacerbate any kind of gut issues they have. So, uh, but for the most part, I, I totally recommend them and I love them personally. Thank you for that warning. I think that's really important. Um, Cause if, if a woman's struggling with several health issues and then they add a healthy thing to their diet, but it actually <laughs> backfires. It's so frustrating. I've been there mm, where yes. I, I added um, water kefir to my diet. I made it myself I, and, and it actually made everything worse. And I talked to my naturopath and she thought, man, is it is it your dysbiosis? Like, is it that you're so sensitive you need to start like on a lower dose? I'm like, I take a sip of this stuff and I run to the bathroom for three days. And it oh, turned wow. out that my body is allergic to anything from the sugar cane plant. And of course I was using cane sugar to make my water kefir. And so this is my warning. It's like sometimes we add something that's seemingly healthy to our protocol when, and it causes us to backfire. It's like, well, sometimes we have to retrace our steps and maybe it's because we have an underlying allergy or sensitivity, or like you said, the chia seeds Although most of the time are very healthy, if someone's has uh, an inflamed bowel right now, it can it can actually make it worse. So, so just <laughs> just because something's healthy doesn't mean it's always healthy for everyone. And 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 also just because something's healthy, it doesn't mean you should like overdo it and take cups of it. So so you said the dosage for pu- the pumpkin seed and flax is at one tablespoon of each, or how does that mm-hmm. work? Okay, yeah, so yeah, just one tablespoon of each, and, and then and you grind one that. Of- Oh, sorry. So you grind that up and then you put it in what a shake or on your cereal or how does that, how do you ingest it? It depends. I mean, like with the pumpkin seeds, I can just take a tablespoon of that. I, some people can. And then with the flax, obviously that's a little different. So it depends. Like I have women put it into a smoothie or if they're eating oatmeal or some other kind of um, breakfast food like that, then they'll do that. Or they'll mix it into, um, you know, they'll sprinkle it on top of a salad or 
uh, sprinkle it into their soup or whatever it is that they're eating. But at some point during the day, they get both of those in. It doesn't oh. need to be taken both at the same time or anything like okay, that. Okay, got it, got it. So they can yeah. put pumpkin seeds. They don't have to grind the pumpkin seeds. They can just put pumpkin seeds on their salad. It's such... I mean, I actually recommend the grinding because okay. that's based on based on the on the information I've done. I've researched. It. I, I recommend the grinding just based on that. But some people don't and they're fine and it works. So I don't want people to stress too much about it, of course, because I'm like trying not to add to the stress plate. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but yes. OK. And how... the, then the sesame and the sunflower is also a tablespoon of each. Mm hmm. Exactly. And, and ground as well. Client. And ground as well. Yes. Okay. I once had a client, funnily enough, I mean, with a sesame, I don't necessarily think you have to grind it because it's so small anyways. And I, I do find that you turn it into more of a butter <laughs> if you grind it. <laughs> so you could run into problems there. But I, you know, I think people can totally experiment and see what works for them. But I did have a client once who was having none of this taking the ground seeds. She was like, this is gross. I don't like this at all, Nicole. What do I do? And she actually came up with seed butters. And so just started, started like grinding the seeds to the point where they become like a butter and, uh, made, and did that. And now it wants to make it into like a commercial product because oh. she has great results with it. I know it's kind of that's, cool. That's very cool because, um, <clears throat> My, our family avoids peanuts because, uh, uh, well, yeah. as many people know, peanuts aren't actually nuts. They're legumes grown underground. And so most peanuts have mold. I mean, you don't see the mold when you buy the peanuts, but that's there. The toxins left behind are there. And so most yeah. peanut butters actually are filled with mold toxin. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, which is sad because I love peanut butter. So uh, oh, for, the last, for like the last seven years, I've gone uh, like almond butter, cashew butter, although cash, cashews, you know, they're less likely to have um, um, mold, but they're still, that's still an issue. Yes. Uh, and um, se I've done the sesame, like the tahini, right? And then the su sunflower uh, butter, I I I've tried that. So making your own, that's a really great idea. Now, for this, uh, for grinding these seeds, should we buy them raw and organic? Or, or mm -hmm. is it okay that they're roasted? Or what is the best... Um, I typically you recommend the raw and okay. organic. Yes, okay. for sure. I mean, again, I recognize too, that we are all in different parts of the country and the world. And, and that's not necessarily always available, but I've had clients to just buy them roasted and, and that seems to have worked for them too. That's so cool. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much for this tip. I think that's great. Uh, and, and it's, it's such a cool way to figure out how to add maybe these more healthy fats to our diet. And what's fun is then figure out what to add them to, because add them, if you decide to add them to your vegetables, now you're eating more vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, you're like, Oh, I got to eat my vegetables. Cause that's the, that's what I put my seeds on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you had mentioned that everyone would benefit from eating more leafy green vegetables. How, how many cups of vegetables a day should we aim for? I usually ask women to work their way up to about two to three cups of cooked leafy greens. I just find that that seems to be the magic amount <laughs> for whatever reason. Great, because I have an HBAT that says she wants two cups of, of greens at every meal. And I'm like, oh, wow. I can't eat anything else. I am only eating vegetables. But it, it does make a huge difference. The second you up your vegetables, like get intentional and do mm -hmm. at least one cup of vegetables at, at each meal, even breakfast, like figure out how to get your vegetables into breakfast and get your vegetables into some snacks. And uh, if you just up your vegetables, it is amazing what happens. Like energy goes up because this fiber... Like you, you'd mentioned that before that the fiber, um, uh, like the flax fiber, for example, and the, and the also fiber from vegetables binds to toxins, but it also binds to the estrogen, the estrogen that the liver has, um, filtered out of our body. And if we have constipation or we don't eat enough fiber, then that estrogen gets reabsorbed, gets activated and reabsorbed. And then we become, that's another reason why we become estrogen dominant, um, so I love that you're, you're mentioning that we should really be intentional with our fiber intake because it's so healthy for removing the, um, unwanted estrogen from our body, removing all these toxins. Now you had mentioned that yeah. you, um, healed yourself of malabsorption of healthy fats. What did you do to heal your malabsorption? Well, I don't know that I've 100% healed myself, but I feel like I've I've definitely got to the point where things are significantly better. I, uh, I mean, it's it's an 
I think it's an ongoing thing, right? Because once you start to have this conversation with your body, uh, the conversation continues. And I don't know that you can ever get out of it. They say ignorance is bliss. (laughs) (laughs) I think to some degree it is. Uh, So what I have found is that I really needed to start from the top down, take a top down approach. So I started with chewing my food. Man, that was the hardest thing. I, I remember, I'll never forget, my dad was militant about us chewing food as kids. He was a freak. Anyway, he would literally sit at the table and tell us to chew our food 25 to 30, 30 times every mouthful. And of course, we rolled our eyes and all the things. But it really, I mean, it definitely set me up with some good habits. But then, of course, that all went completely out the window in film production where you were constantly eating on the go and you didn't even have a moment to sit and it was insane. So that was gone. But so I had to really relearn that. And and I, I say it to all the ladies I work with that you just really have to chew your food. I mean, that is the basic, most starting point of getting your gut health in order and your overall health and your hormones back on track. So that's where we start. And I always start to describe it as a, a mindful practice because that's really what it is. And so you're really focusing on how your food tastes, how your food smells, uh, what it feels like in your mouth, all of those things. And then you swallow it. And so that's like leads you to the second phase. And so the second phase for me was stomach acid production. My stomach acid was really, really low based on, I was just having horrible acid reflux that started in my teens as well and went all through my twenties. It was terrible. And it wasn't until I actually got my stomach acid levels up that I stopped having that problem. And of course, as you know, it's a very common myth in the medical industry that we have too much stomach acid. In some cases, some people do, but for the most part, we have too little and it's a bit of an epidemic and we're unfortunately making the problem exponentially worse by uh, taking these antacid uh, medications Mm -hmm. that were prescribed because on the back of that box, it says, don't take for more than 30 days. And there are people who are on that thing for like 15 years. It's mm-hmm. insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I know I'm preaching to the choir. So <laughs> that was the second thing I had to get my stomach acid under control. And for everyone who doesn't realize the importance of stomach acid, it is so, so critical. It, it helps prevent uh, B12 uh, deficiency because you need adequate stomach acid to absorb B12. Uh, Same for iron deficiency as well. So we are chronically iron and B12 deficient. I'm not surprised why. And so you really have to think about what it is that it's doing. You know, it helps, it helps facilitate the rest of your digestion. So that was the next thing. And then I really had to work on healing my gut lining. I definitely had leaky gut issues. I had chronic issues with skin stuff. Like And even nowadays, sometimes, like if I eat something that has sugar in it or something else, like I get itchy. And so I could potentially have a cane sugar uh, problem like you do. (laughs) So there, that could be it. I've never tested that, but I do find that I, I, or I did find that back then if I, you know, almost everything I was eating, I, I would have like, I would break out in these hives or my skin would just be itchy. It was just not cool. And so I had to figure out like, okay, I got to heal this gut lining problem. And so I worked on healing my gut lining. And then I also worked on addressing the bacterial imbalances because I I definitely had a lot of those after being on the pill. And of course, like I had these chronic yeast infections. So I knew there was something going on with my gut. So that was the final part of it It is was really working on the microbiome. I, I mean, again, it was, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's a long <laughs> journey and I still sometimes have some issues. So it's not like it's perfect by any means, but it's like 95% better. That's wonderful. And yeah, this isn't like a, all of a sudden we're perfect and then we're done. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, hell no. <laughs> it's constantly adjusting and constantly, um, you know, listening to the body because your dietary needs right now might be different in five years. You know, my body started craving more, ve- when I started introducing more vegetables, my body was like, yes, this is what I need. And in, in, in the last week uh, or so, my husband and I have gone meatless, like, because I've interviewed all these people about how you can eat clean and healthy protein from plant-based sources. I have been like a paleo keto person for seven years. I've been like, ah. I have worshiped at the altar of meat and now I am eating plant-based protein and my body's like loving it. I can't believe it. I'm like, I did not, I I, I had in my mind that if I didn't eat meat 
like within a 24 hour period, I would feel weak and kind of faintish. But since I've corrected my, I no longer have diabetes. Um, you know, I no longer have, have adrenal fatigue. I no longer have polys, I no longer have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I've corrected so many imbalances that, um, I can eat a healthy, well balanced vegetable based diet right now. I don't, don't, don't ask me about next week. I don't know. I'm just listening to my body. And, and yeah. so I think it's really important that we don't buy into these, you know, um, these labels, like I'm a vegan, I I'm a keto, I'm paleo. Like your body might not want that for the rest of your life. Like just listen to your body and also be willing to try on something new. Like I, I'm willing to try on a totally new diet and just see how it works for me. So we're getting a lot of our protein from lentils and beans and pumpkin seeds. It's really high in protein, just crazy high in yeah. protein. And um, of course we're avoiding uh, processed food and sugar, avoiding eating a lot of greens, like just a little bit of rice, but really avoiding greens and avoiding bread and avoiding pasta, unless it's uh, the pasta is made from lentils or beans, which is wonderful because it's like, yay, mm -hmm. pasta, but it's actually like really high in healthy protein. And then, of course, focusing on all the vegetables um, and then getting lots of healthy fats. So avocado and the nuts and seeds. And I feel so full and yet I feel so my body feels light and I feel happier than normal. Like, that like I'm, awesome. I, it's maybe it's just because it's taking some stress off the body. I don't know. But right. it's, it, I think if we could be willing to not be so rigid with our diet and be willing to experiment, be willing to try on something new, um, like incorporating a cup or two of vegetables with each meal, like incor incorporating more nuts and seeds and healthy fats and just seeing what happens and not being so rigid with our principles or with our belief system. Because I think that in, ri in rigidity, we stop listening to the, what the body is telling us it needs. Oh, I could not agree with you more. I'm constantly saying that I really don't like these labels. I feel like our dietary needs change quite drastically especially as women, if we're having a baby or pregnant postpartum, when we're younger versus when we're older, we go through all of these different phases and we may want meat or we may need it or we may not. I mean, so it's just, it's so important for us to not get caught up in these dietary labels. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Now, um, to wrap it up, I just want to address stress management. What are some creative ways that you recommend your clients uh, focus on active relaxation or focus on turning off the stress response throughout the day? Uh, so I would say, I mean, I don't know that these are necessarily hugely creative, but they seem to work really well. Uh, I, I recommend alternate nostril breathing a lot because mm. <laughs> it's so easy to just do like sitting at your desk for five minutes or, or even just two minutes and working your way up to five minutes. I think that helps so much. I'm, I'm a big proponent of working in 20 minute bursts. And so you work and then you get up, you do like a one to two minute walk around your house or your office or wherever it is that you're going. Uh, so always like work in those short uh, p periods of time, because otherwise I just find that we get so bogged down and we're staring at our computer and it's just not good. I, I'm a big proponent of the screens being off at by 9 p.m., also having flux on your computer, which is, it's going to block out that blue light on your computer screen. Um, and then also having your phone on night mode as well. So that there's not a lot of this blue light in your face all the time. And like I said, the screen time limiting it to eight to 9 PM. Uh, and then also too, like thinking about how you can dim the lights in your house, because this of course creates your, it creates cortisol production. It makes your body kind of think that you're still outside. It's still light out. Uh, when in fact, what you really need to be doing is winding down. And so I think more than anything, if we could just optimize our sleep, that will drastically change how we function and, and how resilient we are to the stressors in our life. So that's what, like, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of like having my clients create a nighttime wind down routine, almost like soothing yourself to baby, like to sleep, sorry, like you would your baby, uh, because we don't do that. We don't take care of ourselves in that way. And I, when it comes to grounding as well, uh, I have one of those earthing sheets at the end of my bed. I use one of those and it's I like all of the clients who I've recommended it to myself included have a really great night's sleep with it. 
And then I'm all about the essential oils and having a diffuser going, whether it's at your desk or uh, just in your house in general with um, either oils that are going to bring up your energy in the morning and then oils that might lower your energy at night, like lavender. So there's like a number of different ones, but I feel like I could go on and on, but those are like my main ones, I think, at least to start for, for people who are really needing to work on, uh, adjusting that stress threshold. <laughs> I really like this grounding sheet. Uh, you're going to have to share the brand of it so I can put it in the yeah. show notes of the podcast. So you, all of your clients have got a grounding sheet, have noticed a difference. Is it that you, you lie on it when you sleep? It's actually down at the end of your bed. So it's just like this long, like a long uh, sheet that goes at the end of the bed. And uh, it's amazing because it's just like, so your feet, it's like for your feet, right? You're grounding your feet. Uh, and um, yes, it's really incredible. I've, I've had really great results with it. And like I was saying, so many of my clients have too. I'll definitely share, share the link for it in the notes. Okay, great. Excellent. Yeah. You know, I had uh, James Swanick, who's the creator of Swanee's Blue Blocking Glasses on the show. Oh, yes. And so I too. had <laughs> no idea about, like I had heard about sleep hygiene from my naturopath and she kind of gave me the rundown like here's the you know like the 12 things you need to do to, to get better sleep but he went into detail explaining that when we have this light like you know you have your lights on in your living room or your you have your maybe your cell phone or all this light that's coming into your eyes your brain thinks it's a noon it, 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 because the light from your cell phone light from your tablet your your tv uh, your computer, it all, that white light is this equivalent to your brain as though noonday sun. And so, like you said, it stimulates cortisol because your body's exhausted. But your body's like, oh, we got to stay up. Like you're supposed to be awake. It's noon. What's going on? And, uh, and so it actually stops or lowers, lessens the production of melatonin, which is the sleep yeah. hormone. And I was like thinking that this sounds like kind of wacko you know like I'm gonna put a pair of glasses on and it's gonna help me go to sleep like come on like yeah right so he's like I'll send you a pair of glasses and I th thought that was that was very nice of him so he gives <laughs> and I I have to take melatonin every night to go to sleep right like artificial melatonin so he mm -hmm. gave me his glasses I put it on and I could not stay awake past 9 a.m 9 p.m I was like I was like like falling asleep standing I could not believe how well these glasses work and that's just a testament to um, how we really are experiencing light pollution. We Big didn't, time. we didn't have it as much before LCD screens before. I mean, th think about the nineties. Remember, remember the, remember the eighties. Do you remember when oh, it's like, <laughs> we so didn't have, days. we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have oh. computers. We didn't have screens to stare at. We just had the TV, but the TV back then was different. It was much, much different. The boob tube was much different than um, than than the, the the LCD TVs that we have now and the plasma I TVs. I agree more. Yeah. And so uh, I got like you just mentioned. I got the app on my phone that that blocks that turns my phone sort of this yellow color. It blocks the blue blue rays or prevents it from you know making tricking my brain to thinking it's noon. And I noticed that if I forget to turn on the app, because this, this one app that I chose, I like, I, I have to manually turn it on. And if I forget to turn it on, all of a sudden it's midnight because I'm, I'm bad, a bad girl and I'm staring at my phone uh, mm -hmm. past 9 a.m., 9 p.m. And, uh, and I notice I'm like, what, why am I wide awake? It's midnight. I should be asleep. And I look at my phone and go, oh, I didn't, I didn't turn on my blue blocking app. I mean, that's how much it, it, it literally is the difference between me going to bed at 10 PM or 1 AM. If I, I look at my phone in the evening and I, and I ha don't have that app on, it, it tricks my brain to not go to bed till one. I mean, it is right. the reason why we are in this massive sleep, sleep epidemic. And then people take drugs to force themselves to sleep. And then, then they're groggy in the morning. So then they have to over caffeinate. And this is uh, causing more and more stress on the body, which is going to trigger, you know, hormone um, imbalance. And it, the cycle just goes on and on. So a lot of people are self-medicating with either over-the-counter drugs or prescription drugs for sleep. And then, of course, over-the-counter stimulants like Starbucks. And, uh, and it, those, all those self-medications are, are, are not, um, addressing the root cause. It's something as simple as turning off the cell phones and reading a book instead, or getting the blue blocking glasses or the blue blocking, um, 
uh, program on your phone, on your computer. So I love that you brought that up because I think that's so, so such an impactful health statement. Um, mm. even though it's so simple, it's like, that is so simple and it's a free app, you know? So <laughs> it's exactly. great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you've been a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of information. I'd love to have you back on the show. And, uh, to wrap up, is there any stories of success that you'd like to share um, anything that just really stands out that something like a cool story of success of someone that you've worked with that's been able to overcome their problems naturally with your help? Yeah, you know, there was one that really stuck out uh, last year. I actually have an apprenticeship program for coaches who are interested in learning more about women's health through me. And uh, we, I was in the midst of launching it last year, January. And a woman wrote in because everyone who who joins has to apply first. And, and so she explained that she had not had a period in 14 years. Oh and gosh. I know, crazy. And she tried a lot. And she had done my Fix Your Period program and had at that point had recently done it, like within the last like six months and had had two periods since <sighs> starting the program. And she was so blown away that she decided that she just had to participate in the apprenticeship because she was really wanting to get into this work and help women who were also experiencing what she'd experienced. And I mean, if there was ever a story of hope, that was it. Because usually if you haven't had your period for a couple of years, you kind of lose all hope of getting it back. And, and not to mention doctors aren't particularly helpful in, in that scenario. So she was just amazing. And I was so excited to have her in the program because she had had such great results and had truly given up on ever having a period again or really having kids naturally or anything. And and then everything completely turned around. So I don't know. I, I feel like that's one of the ones that really st stands out for me. I feel like if for any woman who is really struggling with a hormonal imbalance or something that's triggered or caused by a hormonal imbalance, there's there's hope, there are answers, and it's so much about just educating yourself and taking ownership of your body. That's like the first step. Wonderful. Well, so you have um, uh, several programs on your website. What should the listeners know about um, when they go to NicoleJardim.com? And of course, the link to that's going to be in the show notes of the podcast. Uh, what programs do you want the listeners to become aware of? So basically, if you go to my site, you'll see my signature program. It's a 12 week fix your period course. And that is, you know, what I've been referencing throughout the podcast. And it's really going to take you through all the steps. It's going to give you the why, what's going on in there and explain to you how, why this is all happening and how you can actually fix the root cause of your hormonal imbalance. And then I have a couple other programs for women who've just come off the birth control pill or another form of hormonal birth control. There's a ditch your birth control protocol. And that's really a step-by-step -step process on the foods you should be eating, the supplements to take, uh, the lifestyle changes to make so that you can, and even the tests as well to get so that you can uh, start to get your hormones back on track after being on hormone, hormonal birth control. I also have the fix your blood sugar protocol. And so this is for women who are dealing with PCOS or PMS and really anyone because we are in the midst of blood sugar and a blood sugar epidemic. We have a bit of a problem with our blood sugar as we talked about. And so this is again, uh, a step-by-step -step process on how to start getting your blood sugar back on track for women who again are dealing with dysregulated blood sugar, insulin issues, pre-diabetes. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, I love your work. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your information. You're definitely welcome to come back. I think we could do an entire episode on stress management as it relates to <laughs> hormones. So you're welcome to come back on the show. I also wanted to point out that you have a podcast. So our listeners who um, happen to love podcasts and health podcasts <laughs> may be interested in your podcast. Can you tell our listeners about uh, your, po their, your podcast and where they can find it? Absolutely. Yes. Thanks for mentioning that. I already forgot about it. Uh, it's the period party, naturally. And uh, you can find it on iTunes. And we are we release a new episode every Monday. Uh, and it's co-hosted with my friend and women's health colleague, uh, Nat Kringudis. She's in Australia. So 
uh, it's hilarious and fun and, and we have a good time and we have some great guests on there and we talk about everything related to women's health and hormones and all the taboo subjects. So it's, it's actually a good, a good podcast to listen to if you're wanting to learn more about what we do. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Of course, the link to your podcast and everything will be in the show notes. And uh, I am so thrilled to hear the feedback from the listeners about uh, doing the, the pumpkin seed flax seed for the first half of their cycle and then the sesame sunflower for the second half. I know I'm definitely going to start doing that because it <laughs> sounds so much fun. I just I can't wait to, to see. Um, I, I don't have polycystic ovarian syndrome anymore, but um, there's always room for improvement. Right. So we're always improving. Always. And so I can't wait to, to see the results from that. Listeners, you can go to the Learn True Health Facebook group, uh, which you just go to Facebook and then search Learn True Health, or you can go to learntruehealth.com slash group to join our free Facebook group for the community. And I'd love for you to share uh, your uh, success around everything that Nicole uh, spoke about today. I want to hear back from you guys uh, as you implement everything you've learned from Nicole Uh, Because it's so important to know that, yes, we can fix our period. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ashley. I want to tell you about something I really believe in, which is nutrition. On my show, I get to talk to specialists throughout the entire health universe, chiropractors, herbalists, naturopaths, mental and emotional health coaches, and licensed healthcare providers. Amazing pieces to the puzzle we call health. All of these, of course, are supposing that you're actually eating. We, <laughs> we eat to get all the raw building blocks our body requires. And that's where the problem starts. There's no more food in our food, right? I think everyone knows about the deficiencies in our soil that our food is grown in. Those deficiencies are passed down to us unless we can supplement. Which brings me to takeyoursupplements.com. These people work with my go-to doctor, my go-to naturopath for all my supplements. I've used them for seven years. My family and I love them. They work. And if you'd love to address your nutrient deficiencies and figure out what supplements are right for you, then you definitely want to go to takeyoursupplements.com. You put in your information and within 24 hours, one of their health coaches contact you and for free, will talk with you and figure out exactly what supplements are best for you, the highest quality for the lowest price that fit into your budget and address your nutrient needs. They're amazing coaches. I've known them for years. I love them. They're wonderful people. They have a huge heart and they really want to help you to dial in your supplements and your diet and your lifestyle to achieve your health goals. So go to takeyoursupplements.com and put in your information now. That's takeyoursupplements.com. You will be very happy you did.